Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Why don't we prepare our hearts? Would you stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord and invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, tonight, we just love you. We're so blessed to be in your presence, God. We thank you for what you've already done in this church service. God, we don't want to stop there. As we open up your word tonight, Father, we pray that you would open it up to us. Impart grace to the hearer tonight. God, give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown tonight. And Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that each and every one will carry it out of this place and produce fruit in every individual life. God, you're so wise and so wonderful, and we thank you and praise you for the ministry of the word tonight. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher. Guide us, instruct us, encourage us, heal us. Give us the vision and the direction that we need. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. We would also ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them. And we pray that you bless them tonight as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say... Amen. You can be seated. Grab your Bible and open it up to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke, the first chapter tonight. And we're going to be looking at a story that is interwoven with the Christmas story. I wanted to, uh, to kind of, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is the best way to say it, but I kind of wanted to stay away from the Christmas narrative simply because of what's going on here at the weekends. And if you missed that message last weekend, you can get it uh, either at the CD counter or online for free. And then this coming weekend, they're going to continue on in that Christmas story. So I wanted to take a look at the story that's interwoven with the story. You, you understand what I'm saying? And, and I was just fascinated by what was going on. Because there was a period of silence after the prophet Malachi had spoken and, and, and they had closed out the words of the Old Testament. There was a period of 400 years where there was no prophetic utterance. There was no word of God. But there was things taking place behind the scenes and God was getting ready for something to happen. God was getting ready to give us, mankind, the earth, his greatest gift and his son. But there were some things that needed to take place in order for that to happen. Tonight, the title of the message is God's Gracious Gifts. This is a season when we give one another gifts. Uh, we we're always looking for the perfect gift. We're always trying to find what people would want, what people would, would, would desire. I was just asking one of my nephews just yesterday about his brothers. Hey, what, what would they want? Where, where could I get it? What could I do? You know, this and that. But God had it in mind to give a gift of himself in the form of his son Jesus to the earth. But things needed to be right. It needed to be the right time, and it needed to be the right season. And we read in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse number 5. Now, we've got a lot of scripture tonight. I, I'm going to warn you in advance, but I believe that you can handle it. And I, and I believe you also kind of know the story, too, for most of us. If, you, if you've read through the Bible or you, you've heard the Christmas story, you've heard the narrative. And so we're going to go fast through it, but we'll pull out some points as we go. Luke chapter 1, verse number 5 says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the, of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we're introduced to two people. There is Zacharias and his wife, Elizabeth. Verse number six, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. Oh, Lord, may that be the testimony of you and I. My goodness, what, what a testimony of their lives. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now look at verse seven, but they had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Now, this is a familiar story. We've seen this throughout the Bible, Abraham and Sarah, as well as others, who were barren and who were well advanced in years, waiting to see what God was going to do in their life. Verse number eight, so it was that while he, speaking of Zacharias, was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went up into the temple of the Lord. Now, stop right there for a second, because... Maybe you don't know, but there was 24 divisions of the priests set up by King David, and they, and they had a, a week during the year that they would serve at the temple, and they would cast lots to find out who was going to go inside the temple and burn incense before the Lord during the hour of prayer. So this was a great honor. This was a great privilege. This would happen maybe once in a lifetime as a priest. So here is Zacharias. Here he goes to do his weekly service, and there his lot is the one that's chosen. He gets the chance of a lifetime to go into the temple before God and burn incense at the hour of prayer. Verse number 10, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside 
at the hour of incense. Verse number 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Verse number 12, and when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, the Bible doesn't record the prayer that John prayed. We can only imagine that while he was doing his service and when he was going and burning incense before the Lord, that one of two things happened. Either one, that he prayed, because the angel said, your prayer has been heard. Or number two, that maybe there was a desire in his heart that he brought with him into the temple, and when he burned that incense, the incense rose up, and it was symbolic of the prayers of the saints going up before Almighty God into the most holy place. And so maybe it was that God maybe didn't hear words coming out of his mouth, but heard the prayer of his heart as he was burning that incense. There was a deep passion and a desire on the inside of him to have a son, and now God answers. And he doesn't just answer with, an assurance or a peace. No, there's an angel standing there before this man. The miraculous is now once again taking place. God is breaking the silence in this moment. 400 years had gone by with nothing, and now here we are in the temple at the hour of prayer, the hour of incense, and an angel shows up. Things are starting to happen. There is momentum once again. Earthside. Take a look at what happens. Verse number 14, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Verse 15, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. See, this is an unusual child. Other men and women of God had come out and the Holy Spirit had came upon them at a young age, or maybe, maybe afterwards like Samuel, the great prophet. But no, from his mother's womb, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What an amazing time this is. Verse number 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. How I wish we had hours just to spend in these verses. Basically what he's saying is this John, this baby that you're going to have is going to be a great man of God, and he is going to prepare the way of the Lord. Jesus is coming. The Messiah is on his way, and he needs a forerunner. He needs somebody to go get everything in order for him so that when he comes, his ministry will be effective, and he will be able to do what God has called him to do. And there needs to be a prophet to come and preach so that the Christ can come and do his work and his ministry. What an amazing time this is. Let's read on. Verse number 18, and Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Verse number 19, and the angel answered and said to him, now I love the response of the angel here, because he doesn't really explain the process to him and he doesn't recount the past victories of God and how God had done this for other people. He just merely introduces himself. Take a look at this. He says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will become mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Now, you know the rest of the story. Here he comes out of the temple and, and, and he's, he's trying to sign to everybody and tell everybody what's going on. And, and, and they realize, well, man, he's seen something in there. He saw some sort of vision in there. And he completes his week of service, and then he goes home to be with his wife. Later on, his wife conceives and bears a child. And, and, and eventually, John is birthed into the world. And they want to name him Zacharias because Zacharias can't speak for himself. And, and Elizabeth is telling them, no, his name's going to be John. And they go to the father and they start to make signs to him. And what do you want to name the child, the baby, you know? And he's, he says, bring me something to write on. So they bring him a writing tablet. And he writes out simply his name is John. And from that time on, his mouth is open and he can speak once again. God is speaking to us during this time. God is breaking the silence at Christmas. And God is showing us some things about his gracious gifts. I'm, I'm a little weird about certain things in, in my life, and one of them is about names. I, I learned very early on that God is very intentional about names. 
And, and this is something that I'm kind of weird about. I kind of am, am quirky about it. I, I like to find out what names mean, and, and, and I'm fascinated when I, when I hear of a unique name or somebody's name, you know, that, that I haven't heard before. Oftentimes, I'll ask a person when I meet them, what does that mean? Or if I know the, the meaning of their name, I'll kind of tell them, you know, hey, that means this or whatever, you know, kind of one of those weird little things. But I, I was studying out this passage and realizing that God is intentionally speaking to us through these people. Zacharias. Zacharias, what does his name mean? His name means the Lord remembers. Very significant after 400 years of silence. Very significant after the children of Israel had been exiled. Very significant after now they had returned and there was another nation ruling and reigning over them. The Roman Empire. But remember that Zacharias was married to a woman named Elizabeth. And Elizabeth means oath of God or my God has sworn. Now when you take the two of these people together and you put their names together, it means that God has remembered the oath that he swore. It's quite amazing. Quite amazing. Sometimes we wonder if God's forgotten us. Sometimes we wonder when God is going to make good on his promise. I can imagine the children of Israel, after 400 years of silence, were kind of wondering if God was taking a vacation. Maybe God wasn't around anymore. Maybe God had utterly forsaken them, and they had messed it all up. It's not unlike you and I. I know that there have been times where I've messed up, and I thought, man, is God even going to take care of me anymore? Have I, have I gone too far? Have I done too much? Sometimes people come to me and they tell me, Pastor, I, I, you don't know what I've done. I've, I, I've, I, I'm too dirty. I, I, I'm too filthy. God can't do anything in my life. But the encouragement for you and I tonight from this story is that when it comes to God giving a gift, it's not based on our condition. It's not based on our worth, but it's based on a birth. Based on the fact that God is gracious and God wants to pour out his blessings and give good gifts to his children and God has not forgotten you God has not abandoned you God has not forsaken you the Bible tells us no God has remembered his promise a couple of things to remember this season I wanted to encourage you as we go into the Christmas season we're going to be with family maybe some of you are going to be alone but if we can remember a couple of things that God has promised us Things that God has said to us, things that God has spoken to us from his word, we'll be encouraged and we'll be able to go further, go on, go on with God. Things to remember this season. Number one thing that I want to encourage you with tonight is that God's timing is perfect. God's timing is absolutely perfect. Sometimes when we're waiting on a promise or we're waiting on God, we're wondering, God, when is it going to take place? God, when is it going to happen? You know, we've been so conditioned by our society to want everything right now. I, I, I want an instant download. I, I want fast food. I, 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 I can't wait any longer. If you, if you don't give it to me in this amount of time, it's free. You know, we wonder, what's taking so long, God? Why, why can't you just give it to me? God, if you're all powerful and you have all the resources of heaven, God, couldn't you just beam me down what I need right here, right now? I mean, we, we've got slogans like, have it your way. We've got iPods, iPads, iPhones, iMac. I mean, we've got all this stuff. And everything's about us, and it needs to be on our time limit, on our time frame. And when things don't go our way, maybe you're not like this, but I know sometimes I start to complain. Sometimes I start to wonder. Sometimes I start to worry. Sometimes I start to try and make it happen myself. But if we can remember that God's timing is perfect, it will calm us down, comfort us, and show us the way of the Father. Remember, God had promised a seed. Way back in Genesis, God had promised the seed of the woman would come. And destroy the works of the devil. God had promised a son. God had promised a deliverer. God had promised a king. And God made good on every promise that he made. Specifically to Zacharias and, and his wife Elizabeth, they had seen the promise of God throughout the Bible. God had promised, rejoice, O barren woman. God had promised, children are an inheritance from the Lord. And so if that was a desire in their heart, even though they were past age, it doesn't matter. Because God had made a promise. Let's take a look back at verse number five. Talking about Zacharias and Elizabeth, actually skip down to verse number six. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So it wasn't because they were sinful that they didn't have kids. Which 
at the time, many people in Israel thought, oh, there's something wrong with them. There's got to be some sort of hidden secret sin. Now, yes, they were sinful people because they were born in the flesh, but the Bible gives them the testimony that they were upright, righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Verse 8, so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest, his lot fell to the incense, to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Now remember, we're talking about God's promises. Talking about God's promises. The angel of the Lord appears to him, drop down to verse number 12, and when Zechariah saw him, he was a troubled and fear fell upon him. Verse number 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Now think about this for a moment. Zacharias was waiting all of his life to do his priestly service. He had a once in a lifetime opportunity. It was his week to serve. Now the lot falls to him and it is the hour of of incense. He goes in and now an angel appears to him during this time and tells him, your prayer is heard. There's a promise that comes to him. And the promise came right on time. God is never late with his promises. In this season, remember that if you've been waiting for something, some of you maybe are lonely in this place and you've been waiting for someone, waiting for a relationship, waiting for a husband or a wife. Some of you guys are believing God for your kids that maybe have went south. And you're wondering, God, how long is it going to take for them to get a hold of this? How long is it going to take for them to get their head on straight? Some of you guys have been waiting for provision. We've all had a rough 2011. It's been an an uphill climb. And even though we've had victories and it's been a good year, many people are looking back on this year and saying, man, this has been a rough year. How long, oh Lord, am I going to have to deal with these struggles, with these weights, with these pressures, with these bills, with these things that are going on? But remember that God's timing is perfect. Here is the man. Here is the woman. Past age. But God is right on time. It was his time. It was his hour. It was his lot that was chosen. And now his prayer is heard. No different with Jesus Christ. God was waiting for the fullness of time. In fact, Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. I'll put it up on the overhead for you. It says, but when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God knew the time and God knew the season. And he knew the right exact moment to send Jesus Christ into the world. He was waiting. He was waiting for the children of Israel to come out of exile. He was waiting for the Roman Empire to be raised up. He was waiting for the sacrificial system to be brought back to the temple. For temple worship to be instituted once again. He was waiting. He was waiting for the priesthood. He was waiting for Zacharias and Elizabeth, and he was waiting for Mary, and he was waiting for Joseph. God knows the times. He knows the seasons. He knows where you're at. He knows what time it is on your watch and in your life. He knows your hour. He knows your season. And there is coming a time that is the fullness of time when God will deliver on his promise to you. You can rest assured that God, his timing is perfect. Second thing that we see as we take a look at this story is that God's word is true. God's word is true. I know that we say that, and, and, and oftentimes we can say a hearty amen to that. I know God's word is true. But think about it for a second. Here's Zacharias, and he's just heard the word of the Lord that he's going to have a son, and he's heard about the greatness of this man that's coming forth and how the Messiah is now coming. I mean, realize for a moment, this is really the first guy that heard the announcement that Christ is coming really soon. I mean, this is the first guy to hear that word because Mary comes next. So here's Zacharias, he hears that the son is coming and that he's preparing the way of the Lord. Wow, Christ is coming. This is, this is real. This is happening now. He's heard the promise. But look at what he does. Look at, at, at verse number 18. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? I'm sorry, excuse me? You're there in the temple and an angel appears to you? Standing beside the altar, so it startles you, and you stand back, and he starts talking to you and delivering you the promise of God, and you want to know how will you know this is true? 
I mean, there's something going on here. It's almost as unbelievable as the children of Israel who had seen the wonders of God in Egypt, had seen the plagues, had seen the Red Sea part it, had seen God provide manna from heaven, quail at night, and now they're complaining to Moses saying, where are we going to get water from? I mean, excuse me. There's something wrong here. And yet you and I have to settle in our hearts that these Stories, these are examples for you and I. Each and everything in the Bible is contained so that you and I can understand God's word is true. Not only is God on time, God is real. Sometimes we don't have a problem with the timing thing. We have a problem with whether or not it's really going to happen because we wonder, is God really true? Is God really want to bless me? Does God really want to heal me? Does God really, does God really want to prosper my life? Does God really, you know, I haven't seen a functional family. Does God really want that for my life? Does God really want me to have peace and love and joy and all these things that seem ideal, but they don't seem real? Why? Because we're hurting. Why? Because we've had disappointments. Why? Because we've had pain. Why? Because we've gone through suffering. We've been backstabbed by people that have been close to us. They've talked about us behind our back. They've hated on us. They've done different things that have violated us. And so we wonder, God, I see the ideal, but I don't know if that's a reality. And yet you and I, when we look at Christmas, when we look at the miraculous, when we look at the things that took place, I mean, here's an angel standing there talking to John, and John wants to know, how do I know? How do I know? Now, let's not get too hard on him, because I know there have been times where God has promised things to us, and we said, God, how do I know? God, how do I know? Now, Mary had asked a, a, a similar question. But her question was not so much about the process, I'm sorry, the possibility as much as it was the process. You get that? See, Mary wasn't saying whether or not it's possible. She was asking about the process. How do I know this will happen because I don't don't know a man, you know? I'm married, but we, we haven't gone there yet. So how will I conceive? And the angel goes on to explain, you will be overshadowed by the Most High God. But this is not a question about the process. This is a question of possibility that Zacharias is asking the angel. Sometimes when we have a promise from God, we let our mouth get in the way of our promise. And I believe that God wasn't punishing Zacharias when he told him, you're going to be mute. I believe that he was protecting him from continuing to stick his foot in his mouth. See what I'm saying? Because you've got a guy that's got an important job. He's going to raise the forerunner of Jesus Christ, him and his wife are going to be the parents, and if this guy's talking like that, he's going to stop this. Why? Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat of its fruit. See, sometimes when we get a promise from God, when we see the word of God, we, we, we'll, we'll say on the surface, oh yeah, I believe the Bible's true. I believe it's real. But the question is not whether or not it's real. Is it real for you? Are you going to implement it in your life? Does God want to bless you? Does God want to heal you? Does God want to do great and mighty things in your life? See, that's where we start lifting the foot, opening mouth, and inserting it as deep as we can. But God doesn't want us to stumble in our words. God wants us to speak his word, declare the promise of God. What did Mary say to the angel? Be it unto me as you have spoken, right? What is she doing? She's coming in agreement and in alignment with the word of God. Whatever promise you're believing God for this Christmas... Remember, we're talking about God's gracious gifts. We're, we're going to go there on this next one, really. But whatever promise you're believing God for, whatever gift you could ask God for, whether it be provision, restoration in your family, your health, your finances, your dreams, your vision, your future, what is that thing that you have a desire in your heart for? And now are you going to speak the word of God and declare in faith, be it unto me as you have spoken? See, what does that mean? That means you've got to find a promise. You've got to get a hold of it. And you've got to find out what the will of the Lord is for your life from the Bible, not from O Magazine, not from Reader's Digest, not from the internet, not from somebody's blog, not from a suggestion of people around you or on the workplace. No, it's got to be word-based. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God is serious about his word. And when you and I stand on the word of God, God will not allow us to fall. God will not allow us to fail. Why? Because if we fail, his word would have to fail in that instance. 
The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. So when you speak the word of God, you're speaking the truth of God. I love how the angel declares to him in verse number 20. He says, but behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words. Look at this. Which will be fulfilled in their own time. What is he saying? He's saying, Zacharias, this is going to happen, brother, with or without you. This will take place. Why? Because the word of God has been spoken. God has spoken now that this man will come into the world. He will be great. He will prepare the way of the Lord. And now God's word can't fail. And so you and I, this Christmas season, as we're looking towards the promises of God, whatever we're believing God for, it's time to find it in the word and start to declare it and believe in God that we will see it in its season. A couple of things to remember during this season. Number one, is that God's timing is perfect. Number two is that God's word is true. Final thing for tonight is that God's gifts are good. If there's anything you're going to go away with tonight, I want you to go away with this, that God's gifts are good. Remember the names. I'm going to go back to the names for a second. You got two people. God remembers, and God has sworn an oath. So God has remembered his oath come together, and it produces John. John means God's gracious gift, the title of our message tonight. When God remembers his promise in the fullness of time and brings forth his word because his word is true, that's a good gift. That is God's gracious gift. That is God's gift that empowers your life to be all that God has called you to be to do all that God has called you to do, to go where God has called you to go, to say what God has called you to say, to give what God has called you to give. You see, God gives good gifts to his children. God is not waiting to make you fail. God is not putting sickness on you. God is not putting death on you. No, God is the author of life. God is the author of goodness. Things that are evil are contrary to the ways of God and contrary to God himself. And God is a good God who gives good gifts to his children. He's not waiting in a cloud to zap you or to hit you over the head with a two-by-four when you mess up. No, he already made a provision for that through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So what is God waiting for? God is waiting to pour out good gifts on you and I. But we've got to come in line with his, his word, which is true. And we've got to wait for the fullness of time was said of John that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Think about that for a second. This is a good gift. This is a mighty man of God. And you remember when Mary greeted Elizabeth, the child leapt for joy in Elizabeth's womb. You can see the Spirit of God all over this man. And now John is the forerunner to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Jesus comes now. God's gracious gift of his son. Jesus, the Savior. Jesus, the Deliverer. Jesus, the King forever. Jesus, the Lord of Lords. Jesus, the Master. Jesus, the Maker, the Creator. The wisdom of God now here in the flesh. God has poured out His gracious gift on you and I. You're there in Luke. Turn back to the book of Matthew, chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7, Jesus is speaking. He's talking about asking, seeking, and knocking. And he says that everyone who asks, receives, he who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 9, take a look at this. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 9 says, What man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Now, we can answer that very simply. No one's going to give their son a stone in place of bread. Why? Because that's cruel. That's mean-spirited. That's not funny. If your son is hungry and desiring something, you're going to go and get that for your son. And it continues on. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Again, easy. We can answer that. No, no one's going to give their son a snake when they ask for a fish. Not going to happen. Look at verse 11. If you then, being evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children. So we all answer those questions very evil, but we know that very easily, I'm sorry. We all answer those questions very easily. But we know that in the flesh that we can't even compare ourselves to God. Why? Because we're in a sinful, fallen state in the flesh. Yes, now we've been redeemed and now we are the righteousness of God in Him. But in the flesh, in the natural, we're very contrary to the ways of God. We're evil. So if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, look at this. How much more? Come on, somebody. How much more? Think about this. Think about the exceeding greatness. Think about the the distance between. How much more? Will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? Maybe you're not getting a hold of this yet. God wants to give good gifts to His children. God wants to pour out blessings on you and I. We say, well, how come I'm not seeing it yet? Well, maybe it's not the time. Maybe we haven't believed the word of the Lord. Maybe we got to get ourselves in faith or get back in faith. Why? Because we can see his promises coming to fruition in the word. And even though we may mess up and we may fail, God will get us back on track. Remember that Abraham and Sarah laughed when they heard the promise of God. And yet Isaac still came into existence. Isaac had followed his father, and here was his wife, barren. Maybe they thought they had messed up, and yet when Isaac prays for his wife, she conceives and bears a son. Later on, we see Jacob and his wives. Jacob had been a rascal, and yet God still brought forth godly children from his lineage. You see, Zacharias, even though he had messed up and he didn't believe the word, God was gracious to him and still gave him a good gift. He still gave him the honor and the privilege of being this great man, John, his dad. Still gave him the privilege of, in his old age, seeing his heritage, seeing his lineage, seeing a son come forth. And even greater, a joy of knowing that the Messiah had come onto the earth. See, God is not concerned with where you've been and what you've done. No, God is concerned with where you're at and where you're going with him. If you realize tonight that, man, maybe you've been impatient, maybe you've been out of faith, it's time to get back into the things of God. It's time to start declaring the word of God. Maybe you haven't had a promise. It's time to get a hold of a promise. Man, if any time, if any season to open up the word and break it out and see what the Bible says about you and I, this is the time. Why? Because God sent his son in the fullness of time, born of a woman, born under the law. God gave us Jesus, the greatest gift he could ever give. We could all probably quote John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What is God speaking to us tonight, in this Christmas season? Some things to remember for you and I. Number one is that God's timing is perfect. Number two is that God's word is true. And number three is that God's gifts are good. Tonight, if you got something from the word of the Lord, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to have a great time this weekend. So, hey, um, we've got a little bit of time. So do you mind if we do something a little different? Thought it might be kind of fun. Now, Pastor Deborah, I didn't ask her whether or not this was okay, but she had prepared some some little things for dealing with family. Pastor Deborah, would you want to just give us those things real quick? No? Okay. Fine. Be that way. What's that? She said yes? Why don't you come and tell us about those things? She had, she had shared with me today that uh, she had some things on her heart about just being with family and, and, uh, and at the Christmas time. Why don't you come and, and share those things with us real quick? You guys okay? I know this is a little different. I wasn't prepared for this. I know you weren't. And my knees are showing. Uh-oh. And you know, there's a rule, you never show knees on the platform. So don't look at my knees. Will this help if I... That's much better. (laughs) Well, Dan had had called us and Jim and I were off doing something on Monday and Tuesday. And and so I had thought I was on the schedule for Wednesday night and it turned out Dan was. So I had this little message 
So I was just sharing with Dan, just some things God had put in my heart. And the title of the message was, How to Stay Sane When Your Relatives Are Crazy. So I don't know if any of you have got some real dysfunctional families or crazy relatives. You love them, but you want to put them in the deep freeze. I was just kind of thinking about how we're all going to have opportunities in the next couple of days, probably to be with family or friends. And, you know, this is all about relationships, isn't it? It's either relationships or money <laughs> or something. So I was just thinking, number one was that God says that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 in the Message Bible, which I don't know if they can get it up there or not, but it says, grab the initiative and how you want people to treat you, treat them. And I was just thinking, if we're going to be the light that shines, then when we go to the family table or to the family relative's house or they come to us, how would you want them to treat you? And it says, grab the initiative. You do it first and treat them that way. How wonderful would it be that if we just remembered that this Christmas? How about this one? The family get-together is not the place to settle issues. Just be the light that shines. So simple. Be the light that shines. You're not going to fix things this Christmas at the family get-together. So just don't even try. And if you don't expect them to act a certain way or to be a certain way for you, then you're not going to be disappointed. So just grab the initiative and love them the way you want them to love you and respect you. Because guess what? They're not going to think of you like your church family thinks of you or God thinks of you. Because a prophet is never without honor except in his own family. So you've changed, but they're just waiting to see the old you appear, right? So just give them a great surprise. Just be your wonderful selves. Grab the initiative and treat them the way you wish that they would treat you. Don't try to settle issues because they're not going to get settled this Christmas. But God, like Dan, Pastor Dan preached, God's not late with his promises. He will answer that prayer. And Zacharias and Elizabeth, that prayer that Zacharias had prayed and Elizabeth had prayed, was probably a lifetime prayer. That was probably a prayer they had prayed through their life because they were full of disappointment that they never had a son. And God hears the lifetime prayers. He hears your lifetime prayers, the prayers of your life that aren't answered, that you just cry out every, Lord, when, like Pastor Dan was saying. So grab the initiative. Don't try to settle issues. How about this one? Laughter is medicine. Laugh. At the situation, not at your relatives. <laughs> How simple is that? And then just the last little thought was pace yourself. Pace yourself, my darling children. You get tired, and this is a crazy, busy season. So let the rest of God and the moments of God, the Selah moments, you know, in the Psalms, when you read a Psalm and David or whoever wrote the Psalms, you'll see that little word Selah, S E L A H, Selah. It means pause. Stop and just think about what you just heard. And we need those Selah moments with God. Just that, okay. Just let him wash you. Let him settle you down. Let him tell you that it's all okay. It's all going to be okay. Because the best message he gave us was what the angel said. On that Christmas Eve, behold, I bring you tidings of great things, great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was a host of angels crying out and saying, peace on earth. Goodwill. God's goodwill to men. So it's all going to be okay. Praise God. I, I, uh, I'm glad that she got to, to share that with us because she was going to have to wait a year if we didn't do that. <laughs> just kidding. Well, we love you guys, and we're just so happy that you guys came and shared in the word today. Excited that we got to be in God's presence. And, and you know what? Let's not stop here. I want to make sure that before some of you guys leave, 
that your heart's right with God. You know, it's one thing to know about God. One thing to have God in your head. A lot of times people say, do you know God? Well, that's, that's really not a great question because everybody knows God. Everybody knows about Jesus. Everybody's seen the nativity sets during this time of year. Maybe they've even heard Linus reading it on a Charlie Brown Christmas, the story. But this is not about what we have in our heads that counts with God. Before you leave this place, I want to make sure that you're right with God. And head knowledge is not going to make you right with God. Head knowledge is not going to get you into heaven. Just because you know about something doesn't mean that it does anything for you. There's a lot of people in America that have God in their head. But they're far from God. And so tonight I want to make sure that if this was your last night here on the planet, God forbid that should happen to anybody in this room, but what if? What if we closed our eyes here on earth and opened our eyes in eternity? I want to ask you this question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. If that were to happen to you, your heart stopped, you died, you closed your eyes here on earth, you opened your eyes in eternity, where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. Now let's examine your answer because by the way you answered, it tells us a lot about where you're at with God. Some of you answered that question and you said, well, I think I'd go to heaven. I think so. But the problem with that statement is, could you show me in the Bible where you can think your way into heaven? Like I think, I think, I think, and whoever's the most positive thinker gets to go to heaven. It's not there. No, the Bible doesn't say you can think hard enough and get to heaven. Some of you said, I, I hope I would go to heaven. I do hope so. But again, could you show me in the Bible where it says you can have enough hope, like I hope, I hope, I hope, and whoever has the most hope gets into heaven? It's not there. Nor in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven. Somebody said, well, maybe I'd go to heaven. Maybe not. I really don't know. But the Bible tells us that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt where we're going to go. The Bible tells us we can be assured where we're going to spend our eternity. And if you don't know, I want you to listen up tonight. Because I don't think anyone in this room is saying, yeah, I want to go to hell. I want to party on. No, that's, that's just foolishness. Because we know that, that hell is a real place of torment. And no one wants to go there. So tonight, what makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Why would God allow you to come into heaven? Is it because you've been a good person? A lot of times people say, well, if I'm good enough, I'll get to go to heaven. God lets good people into heaven. But the problem with that statement is, could you show me in the Bible where it tells you how good you have to be? Because the standard is perfection. And the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. God is not making a list and checking it twice of who's been naughty and who's been nice. And based on that, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to work your way into heaven. Your good works are like filthy rags to God. They're going to be thrown out. Someone needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. And I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, by just doing good works. Some of you might be thinking, well, not only have I done good things, but I was raised in church. My parents took me to church as a child, went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck and had you baptized or christened as a child. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians. But again, the problem with that thinking is nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents take you to church and call you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says America is the Christian nation and everybody born in America goes to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven. Some people might say, well, you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church here, I'm in, sit, sitting in church tonight. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm right here in front of you, Pastor. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you're here tonight. But show me that in the Bible where your church attendance gets you to heaven. Where you sit in a seat in a sanctuary, warm up a spot, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, just go to church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Anymore, you can go to your garage at your house. Sit there in your garage and say that you're a car, and that makes you a car. It doesn't work. You're just a person sitting in your garage. Not going to make it to heaven just by sitting in church, calling yourself a Christian. 
Some of you might be thinking, well, you know, that's great, but not only have I attended church, my last church I got involved. I sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. It's great. Once again, I'm very glad you did those things, but could you just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven? Could you show me where it says you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, sing in the choir, people think of you as a leader, you teach in the Bible classes, that that gets you in heaven. It's not there. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God is waiting at the gates of heaven when you enter, checking to see if you got a membership card in your wallet to a church. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, I love you enough tonight, respect you and honor you enough not to play games, but to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. So you might be saying, well, yeah, but you know what? I, I, I know God. Well, we discussed that already. Just because you know him in your head doesn't make you a Christian. Everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what's in your head. Why? Because the Bible says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and even quotes scriptures in the Bible, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So it doesn't matter how much you know that you could quote scriptures, that you know about the baby in the manger, sing the songs every year of your life, celebrate the resurrection at Easter. Listen, if it's only up here, it's not doing you any good. So what is God after? How do we get to heaven? Some of you might be saying, well, Pastor Dan, now you get to heaven your way, I'll get to heaven my way. All roads lead there. Well, really, do all roads lead to the moon? No, there's one way you're going to have to get there. In the same way with God. God outlines it in his word. You think he just leaves it up to whoever or whatever? No, God wants us to be with him. God wants to give us a good gift of salvation, of deliverance from hell. And yet, there's a way that we have to find out from his word how to get there. Jesus came to a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Now, hold on for a second. Let me tell you about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy, did good deeds in his community. He was raised up in his church called the synagogue. In fact, he, he attended there often and, and eventually became one of the leaders. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? He could debate the scripture. He did good deeds in his community, and people looked to him to find out about God. He was considered a leader. And yet when Jesus speaks to this great man, he doesn't say, hey, Nick, man, you're doing a fantastic job. Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Now, I know our society has mocked that term. They've, they've raked it through the coals and made it out to be something that it's not. But this is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. This is all or nothing with Jesus. Let me show it to you in the Word. Book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking, and he says when he comes, he wants to find you hot or cold, because if he finds you lukewarm, he'll vomit you from his mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? What does lukewarm mean? Well, here's what it means, a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, look out. Why? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to go just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hands. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying how I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be, you might be saying at this point, whoa, 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 wait, time out. Did you just say you're going to point at me and count? I'll be embarrassed if you point me out like that. I mean, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. Listen, if that's what's going on, get over it. Why? Because isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Listen, Jesus went to the cross, a public spectacle for you and I. Don't you think we could trade a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity with him? Come on, you can do this. No one's judging you. No one's criticizing you or condemning you or laughing at you. We want you to do this. We're excited for you. And even if you are embarrassed, better than being in hell. 
Listen, Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Wow. But he said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Don't leave this place the same. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm and you know that's the condition of your heart? Come on, you can make a right relationship with Jesus Christ. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, or even online, wherever you're at, all over this nation and the world, you can raise your hand right where you're at, and then we'll pray with you right afterwards. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up all together on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. You don't have to stand. You can just sit. Thank you. There's one. Real excited about going for God. There's two. There's three. There's four. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see on this side? We got four wise people already all over here. Where are you at over here? Come on. Anybody else real quick? Four wise people. Real quick. I didn't see your hand, but you know you need to give God all your heart. You know you need to give God all your life. Anybody else real quick? Come on. Come on. Where are you at? I know there's more of you. You need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Don't wait. Where at? Is that a hand right there? Thank you. Got you. Number five. Anybody else real quick? Come on, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should. Come on, go for it. Go for it. Anybody else real quick? There's number six, number seven. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Number eight, gotcha. God bless you. Eight wise people already. Come on, number nine. Come on, number nine. You're waiting for this moment. This is, this is to you. Wondering if God's speaking to you. He's tugging at your heartstrings right now. Just, just let your hand go and lift your hand. And acknowledge your need of a Savior. Come on right now. You want to give God all your heart? Want to give God all your life? You know you need to do this. Where you at? Where you at, number nine? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a praise for eight wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Hey, all eight of you, or if you're number nine, or you're not number nine, but you're number 10, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. You still haven't missed out. I'm going to give you an opportunity, so don't miss out, okay? Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to sing a song. As we do, we'll give a clap and a shout. That's your cue. Get your stuff. Get a coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend if you need a friend, whatever you brought with you to church. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. So let's all stand and welcome them as they come. And you just make your way. You raised your hand or you should have made, raised your hand. You just make your way to the front right now. You come. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. For you alone. Hallelujah. Breath that I take. You can come too. Every moment I'm away. Lord, have come on, your come on, come on, come on, we'll wait for you. Me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Everybody else, if you need to come, come on, just make your way to the front. And I live for you alone. It's every breath that I take. All right, they're still coming. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, everybody up front, look up at me for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? You came to give God all of your heart. You came to give God all of your life. Now, God doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He comes into your heart when you invite him. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, okay? It's a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? You're going to be born again. All right? Now, those of you that are watching online or you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, you can pray this prayer right now where you're at. Now, this is not about the words so much as it is about your heart. So if you stumble on a couple words, don't worry about it. You're still going to be born again, all right? So let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And I want you to say this all out loud together. Everybody else will join in. Say, Father God, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. I give you all of my heart and all of my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. 
Wash me with your blood and make me clean. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And let it be known that from this day on, I am saved. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. Headed for heaven. Denying hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Now, you guys have been born again. Now, with a baby, when somebody's born, you don't just leave them there and don't do anything with them, right? You got to take care of them. You got to teach them, okay? Now, we want to help you in your walk with God. We don't want to just leave you here to fend for yourself, all right? So right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really neat guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? What he's going to do, he's going to do two things. He's going to give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? And then secondly, he's going to introduce you to a friend, okay? We call them spiritual personal trainers here at The Rock. You know, you heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, that sort of a thing. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. They'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how that works. If you guys will just make a left turn and follow him, he'll get that stuff to you and introduce you to that friend. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.